some questions and give some updates for, for our frontliners. Um, then definitely we wanna make sure that uh, we're giving him all of his due attention. Uh, so our format's gonna be um, a little bit of introduction and some background on Dr. Ayati. Um, he's gonna have his presentation. Um, if you have a question, um, feel free to enter it in the, the, the group chat, the, the chat for everyone in the room. Uh, otherwise, just for convenience sake, um, I'm gonna go ahead and mute everyone. And then uh, the questions as they, as time allows, we can, we can also answer them on the fly or um, we can open it up to uh, an open form Q&A towards the end. Okay, so I'll go ahead and mute everyone. Um, but um, let's see here, except for Dr. Ayati, of course. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and get it started. All right, Dr. Ayati, um, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Paul, uh, let me see. Hello, doctor. Are you there? Yeah. Do you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. It was some... Okay, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. And uh, I really appreciate for caring to, to arrange this today. Um, for have some discussion. I'm just going to do a quick presentation. I'm not going to go through all the slides, but as a daily basis, we have our presentations for different organizations and institutes. And it's very interesting because I've, I've in my entire my, uh, life of career, I've never had this, that I have to change my slides and numbers every single day because that for this uh, COVID-19, we get new information every single day from experts and what we are observing for the last, uh, um, um, I will say three to four months since the beginning of this uh, crisis. Um, I'm going to go um, just to spend more time for you for answering the question. I'm going to go quickly go through this slide because that can help for uh, possible some of your questions maybe actually um, and you can find most of the answers through these presentations and if there's all other question I can help you through your uh, um, special situation that you're dealing uh, with. Now, okay. uh, the first thing is I wanted to talk about history of the COVID-19 symptoms, diagnosis, management, prevention, and, um, and the future. And that is gonna start the story that you all hear that in uh, December, late December, 2019, there was a very unusual things happen in uh, Wuhan and, and capital city of the Hubei, which is a series of pneumonia um, rapid killing pneumonia, we'll call it. And that was uh, the strange thing happened at that time. And you probably know the, uh, we, the first they thought this is influenza. And then they found that probably this mysterious uh, pneumonia, it's a novel coronavirus. Initially, they named it severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2. Later in February, the WHO called it COVID-19. And um, it's a very interesting uh, virus uh, we have. It's still the question about the transmission, but so far we know, based on what we saw in Wuhan, that possibly it's initiate, I mean, the initial uh, association with the seafood market that actually they were selling live animals and then uh, probably through the bats, uh, pieces of the bats goes to um, uh, this animal, which we call pangolin, it's kind of like anteater, and uh, they actually use the meat in the uh, Chinese medicine, and also the uh, meat is very uh, yeah. uh, delicious for some people, and that's why the, the beginning of that situation has started, but right now, it's not an animal transmission, it's just more person-to-person -person transmission, now we're dealing. I just quickly want to say, this is the SARS-CoV-2 it's a very interesting about this is a, a better coronavirus. Uh, it's the same as a subgroup of something we had it in 2003, we call SARS or acute respiratory, severe acute respiratory symptom. 
and uh, but definitely has a different claim. The interesting about this virus is, uh, the, as you see here on the slides, you see the spikes around the virus, and this is what we call coronavirus. And as you see here, that's an envelope around it, and this is an RNA virus, which is this is the one is trying to get into the body and start to. Uh, make the problems. And as we see here, um, and, and the, we have two forms of this virus right now, L form and S type. L form is around the 70% of the strain, which is the first early days of the epidemic in uh, China, and the S type, which was a 30% as well, which are two type of it. I just quickly want to say, because a lot of people actually these days are talking about, we have um, uh, in 2003, as you hear, we had oh, SARS, yeah. and in 2012, we had from bat to the camel, and we had MERS, which is uh, coming uh, through the camel, and that's what we call Middle East, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. And now in 2019, we have SARS-CoV-2, which is a coronavirus disease, the three type of the virus that so far we have. Um, case fatality rate is changing. If you really wanted to calculate case fatality, this is the number of the people actually dying, and um, and this is going to be the number of the people infected. When we have SARS, total of the people infected was 8,000, but 800 of people they died, which is 10 percent case fatality rate. In MERS, we had 850 people they actually died from 2,500, which is actually significant goes to 34% of the case fatality for MERS. For SARS till April 1st, we have 850,000 people around the world infected, but actually the number has been changed late last night. 41,000 people globally died. That put the number for 0.4 to 1.4. What the reason is a range, because we still have a lot of people they actually infected, and we really don't have a test to find them. This is why it is important to understand the case fatality rate is changing. Definitely for people, they are older. Anybody has cardiovascular problem, even high blood pressure, any history of the coronary artery disease in the past, any congestive heart failure, diabetes, chronic lung disease, if they have asthma, if they have COPD, chronic bronchitis, they actually, or even history of the cancer right now or even in the past, they have a high risk of the mortality so far in the last four months, as we know. Adults, uh, middle-aged people are the most uh, uh, people that are getting involved. involved. We have a several uh, cohort um, from the hospitals patients with COVID-19. The median age between 49 to 56 years. And in the report we have from the Chinese center, um, technically the range between 30 to 79. What we see today in the United States, the younger people also getting more involved the same thing we notice also in South Korea and also Italy as well. Mortality is higher in older adults. 80% of the death is actually the people more than 65. In children, the symptoms is start, uh, actually we have the children's got infected in Wuhan. It's a very mild symptoms in the children and uh, um, only 2% of the children um, actually in Wuhan got infected less than 20 years old in the pediatric zone. The most of the symptoms in children are very, very uh, mild, like they have some fever, cough, sore throat, and um, they, all of them, there's survive. Sadly, for the last 48 hours, we have a couple infants, they died, one in uh, Chicago and one in New York. And that became a little bit more concerned. Now, you probably hear for the last 72 hours, there are more cases less than 20 years old. They actually passed away in Russia than also a couple of cases in Italy. That brought a concern that this virus is mutating. And that's probably going to be a new threat for the younger generation as well. We have some uh, findings so far. We see the men is actually, they are more um, um, getting infected. We have in both in Italy and also in China as well. US is still, we don't have uh, data about the men. Uh, researcher believes that the reason for men is probably men has more poor lifestyle. They're smoking more drinking and general poor health. And I mean, uh, when we compare to the women. And um, overall, because of more unhealthy habits as they have. And the other thing is the women overall, they have, the women, they have the stronger immune system when we compare with the men when they're fighting with the uh, infection. 
the big nightmare for all of us is asymptomatic people. I mean, this is one of the things that we have. Um, as experience, I can say when I'm as a practicing physician, influenza or any other viruses, you always spread this virus in infected people. I mean, they have symptoms. They have either cough, they have fever or something. This virus is very unusual. Many people that they actually been asymptomatic, they still can shedding the virus. Even you probably hear today that experts actually announced and they're trying to communicate with the uh, um, Oval Office in Washington that maybe we should have a mask for everyone. This is something that till yesterday they actually said no mask for anyone but now they um, have the new uh, finding that even people with talking um, they can have um, um, uh, spreading this virus around and that becomes a very very um, um, issue as you probably hear about when we have a COVID-19 outbreak in the cruise ship and um, many of them they actually been absolutely asymptomatic but it's still uh, shedding this virus and and, uh, um, and it's very interesting because one of the other findings that we found, which I can go to the next slide, uh, from people that they are absolutely asymptomatic, um, in China, like 20, uh, one of the study has been done in 24 uh, patients. This is objective clinical uh, study. They found even they don't have any symptoms, no cough, no fever, nothing. 50% of them, they have positive finding in CT scan means we did the CT, they have something. And five patients, um, they had low-grade fever from that group of 24 uh, later. Another study done in 55 uh, patients, absolutely asymptomatic. And they actually, um, they, they, what happened is they tried to trace the contacts. And they found interesting, 67% of them, they have positive finding of pneumonia on their CT scan. Even they have nothing, no symptoms, no fever, no cough, extremely doing well, but they still have the finding in their CT scan, which brought a, a major um, nightmare for practice. Um, as you probably hear, the rate, transmission rate, 30% um, of the people that are actually transmitting this disease is asymptomatic people. Mild to moderate, which they have a little bit cough and fever, the 56%, and the severe 10 and 4% for the critical uh, people. And, um, and that's uh, the, the next thing is about uh, how, much, how many people actually can get infected from this virus. And that's going to be, de depends on the different uh, viruses, as you, as you see here in the slide. In the mid, in, in like for example, somebody has MERS, which is Mediterranean. Um, it can infect 2.5 to 7.2 people. SARS 2 to 4. The worst um, virus is measles. Measles can um, actually infect like 15 people at the one time. But for COVID-19, every single person can infect two to two and a half uh, people, um, which is technically two to three people. How is transmitted? Which is always uh, the question for many of us. As we discussed, mainly respiratory droplet, you're all knowing it, the same thing as influenza. And um, anything like cough, or sneeze, or talking of infected person to somebody else, they can easily get infections, which we call direct contact. But we know today that even through the blood, and especially through the feces, because many people, especially the strain in the United States, many people, they have diarrhea. And through the diarrhea, uh, they can actually easily um, uh, shed the virus. This is very concerning. If you buy a food from somewhere that somebody has a diarrhea and contact um, your technically your, 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 your plate or even the food, that's going to be the concern about that the, still the virus can exist. Or even somebody has a diarrhea and not washing the hand very well, and you go to grocery store and buying something. This is why we have to really uh, make sure that we protect ourselves as far as like a, uh, um, um, cleaning. And um, as in direct contact, we know, um, we have the study has been done and showing that touching the area, it's so important, two to three days on the plastic area, on the metal can actually can stay between six to nine days, but technically on the copper to four hours and 24 hours in the cardboard, but the only things for air, which I'm gonna to go to the next slide, this is um, a New England Journal of Medicine just published um, end of the February, 
which is um, in, in the study shows that actually can stay in the air for three hours. Like if you are in the room with the patient and the patient starts to coughing, and if you don't have any protection gears for yourself, you have to think about in, this, in the closed room, the three hours this virus can stay in that area. And that's something that we, this is why we, it's important that we discuss about more PPEs for people. This is the slide showing that a time of, um, like your, for example, you can see here that for like uh, three hours, it's around for um, um, air and coppers and cardboards and uh, steel and plastic, which is the plastic is the most the one. And we, we have to understand about how much this virus can stay. Overall, this uh, a virus incubation period is five days at the time when you get the virus till you become um, symptomatic between two to five days. Uh, some of the people actually start to developing symptoms within 11 days, like technically 97%. You may not have any symptoms for like day eight, nine, 10, and after that you're gonna have. And um, uh, from 10,000 cases in China, uh, more than 100 of them, they have symptoms after 14 days of active monitoring and quarantine, which makes it a little bit more scary because they're still even after 14 days, they haven't had the symptoms, but after 14 days, they develop the symptoms. And the recovery time, if you have mild infection is overall two weeks. If you have severe infection, they we talk about six weeks. I just wanted to say here, because this is so important to remember, and this is only showing that how this virus with this, all the spikes getting to the cells, like for example, it comes to the lung cells, this is AC2 receptors, and this is the way the virus coming inside our body. I just want to show it here because then later you may are going to ask me a question about the treatment. As you see here, when the virus is going to come here, first through these receptors, this picture, they're actually getting inside. This is, imagine this is your lung cell, pulmonary cells. And the virus can start here. What happened is the virus is um, it's a dictator and try to use your system to, as a slave to produce more RNA. This is the RNA of the virus. And as you see here, this is your host. This is your cells that start to producing tons of RNA for the virus through this enzyme, which is a very important enzyme. As you see here, from one RNA, you have already four RNA. Who made this RNA? protein for the virus and this is why the virus makes tons of baby virus and that baby virus is going to leave and make go infect every other places and all the alveolar and the lung this is the way this virus using our system in order to produce um, the rna and the protein this is important because we're going to come back again in in few moments about the medica and this is the way actually affect the lung as well initial presentation of the virus is a uh, fever fatigue some of the people may have dry cough. Some of them, they may have anorexia. Some of them, they may have, um, um, they may have um, other symptoms like, for example, muscle pain. And um, and um, dyspnea and uh, the, the sputum production as well. And that's probably going to be the um, um, uh, presentations for most of the people. Fever, it's not usual. Most of the people, they um, don't have a fever. 20% have a low-grade fever. Some of them, they actually even um, uh, don't have any fever at the beginning. And uh, uh, only 44% of people in China, at the initial, they had a fever. But when they admitted to the hospital, all of them, they had a high fever as well. But most of the cases, they don't have any fever at the beginning. Um, some of the other symptoms, as you see here, you see diarrhea, you see they have a low oxygen. Definitely when become septic, they actually affect the heart. We, we actually see many cardiac arrhythmia for the last weeks in people that got admitted to the hospital and pneumonia that we see as well. Other symptoms that we see, um, loss of the smelling, and some people have this uh, report, especially most of the cases in France and Italy, they said at the beginning they have loss of the smelling. Some of the uh, people actually, they lost the taste as well. Um, runny nose is not very common, but some people have some mild runny nose. Um, and headache also is another symptom. So a lot of people before the symptoms are gonna start, they actually complain of the headache. 
Um, one thing that we know that 81% um, of the cases, they only have mild symptoms and is necessary not any um, 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 severe symptoms at that point. But uh, some of the cases, they may have the um, severe, which is going to be the time we have shortness of breath, we have low oxygen. And in um, some of the cases, which are going to go to the hospital and ICU, they go to the situation of respiratory failure. This is the way that the people die adult respiratory distress syndrome, which cause shock and multi-organs failure, and in 5% of the cases, that actually makes the cause. How is diagnosed is definitely a PCR, uh, which we call RT-PCR, is a reverse transcriptase PCR. It's, uh, it's a test that we perform in uh, nose or, or, or mouth, or we can also do blood sample, we can do also stool. Um, it really depends on accuracy based on the sample, based on the kit, based on the technician's error and um, shipment time. These are all very, very important. And, um, but again, it's, a, it's, it's expensive um, actually test. It's not um, because reagents is expensive. Um, and there's, as March 18, you probably hear the 15 minutes test of Abbott was approved by FDA. Um, which is um, cost is, is still unavailable, but this is another test that we can do. Other tests that is um, um, one question that a lot of people they ask me, and we actually we faced for the last two weeks in many nursing homes that some of the staff they became negative, but they're symptomatic. They went back and they test again and they became positive. And when somebody is negative, is it the true negative? The answer is no, because it can be poor quality of the swabs. It can be the area that we made the swab that doesn't have a lot of the virus um, concentration. And sometimes virus is not made to upper respiratory region. And, um, and the other things, think about it, this RNA virus is so sensitive. They can degrade so fast. The best solution based on CDC recommendation that they need to swab multiple area, like from the throat, from the nose, to get the final um, answer. In China, they started to do CT scan um, for the diagnosis because they didn't have enough PCR tests. And it's just uh, the one finding that they, we, we see, as even say um, I, I, at the beginning, they may have ground glass opacity. You can see here, I'm looking with the pen. This is the finding that we can see in their um, CT scan. Um, chest CT scan is helpful with the diagnosis, but again, they cannot completely rule out the infection. Um, in a study that we've done in more than 1,000 people in Wuhan, um, they went to both RT-PCR and also CT scan. A positive CT scan, which you see on the picture, has a sensitivity of like 97%. Um, but again, uh, the specificity is only 25%. The reason is because this finding is not a specific for only COVID-19. Somebody can have influenza and can have the similar finding as you see even here on the chest X-ray or on the CT scan as well. Somebody can have um, uh, uh, any other kind of virus or infection or even bacterial pneumonia and can have the same finding. That's why we really don't know. And don't forget, we also had a lot of mortality with influenza this year. Still, we have a lot of mortality with influenza right now in the United States that is not COVID-19, it's just influenza. And quickly about, these are some of the study that has been done. Um, definitely for home care, we all knowing that, using the face mask, separate themselves, and try to uh, do it. Some of the questions that maybe the people ask you about, when can I be out of isolation? If we do based on the test, um, and the test positive, and we do the test, it's um, technically we should have a negative test results, at least two tests from nasopharyngeal swab in more than 24 hours apart, which is a separate of 24 hours. If two tests is negative, definitely. Plus, we have at the same time improvement of respiratory symptoms, no more cough, no more shortness of breath, and no fever. But if you don't have a test and somebody wants to be out of isolation, seven days after the first symptoms appeared, if there's no more symptoms, and at least 72 hours, there's no fever, no cough, nothing else, without using a Tylenol. That's very, very important. 72 hours, no fever without using a Tylenol. If somebody is still taking Tylenol and doesn't have a fever, it doesn't mean as a fever, because if they stop the Tylenol, they're gonna have a fever. 
some people again uh, said that I have my test is positive, but I really don't have as any symptoms. What should I do? Um, or can I go back again? Can I be out of isolation? Whenever we have seven days uh, from the date of the test positive and there's no symptoms, yes, that person can be out of isolation. That's going to be good for many of the cases at home when their test is positive and they don't have any symptoms after seven days, especially for many of you in the business of um, caregivers. If, you're, if your client is positive but no symptoms after seven days, they can be out of isolation. They don't need to be isolated. Um, as far as like a prevention, we already know that it's the most important thing the only way that we can be successful in treating this uh, virus is um, we uh, need to isolate the people who are infected from non-infected. That was, was successful in Germany, was successful in South Korea. That's the same thing we need to do. And this is why we are on shelter in place right now. Some of the tips for uh, prevention, alcohol 70%, bleach is important. Uh, for the food, you at least if you buy your food from the restaurant, Definitely heat it or microwave it at least for a couple of minutes, 30 seconds to one minute. If you buy any fresh fruits for your patients or for anyone, definitely we need to wash it because it, they can be touched by someone and as you can stay in that area for a while. Definitely do not have contact with the farm animals and wild animals for now because we're really not sure about this virus actually being um, is spread through the animals right now. We still, a lot of researchers are working on it. The same thing is going to go with the pets. If the pets of the infected persons, they can still have the virus and shedding the virus. That's very important to know. As far as like um, 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 the, the other things for a public and healthcare worker, you probably know that the best uh, things is just the washing. We know that. And again, as far as like a virus, uh, virus are very small particles. They can easily penetrate with most of the mask um, and they can go through the eyes. Uh, the size of the COVID-19 is something around 60 to 140 nanometer. It's just very, very small. Um, a 95 respirator, which um, is kind of mass, um, can filter out the particle between like 0.1 to 0.3 micron in size. Um, definitely um, in comparative mask, surgical or face mask it's not going to prevent you from not getting infection. It helps the people get infected to not spreading the virus out. And 95, it's going to help the healthy person to not get the virus to the system. And this is why um, it's important to differentiate between two uh, these things. But, um, and, um, and that's something that we just need to remember about the use of the mask as well. I just want to say quickly about the treatment. You don't need to know all the details, but some of you, you may hear about uh, um, uh, remdesivir, which is um, uh, initially produced by uh, gliot. This um, uh, medication is uh, anti-RNA virus, first uh, was developed for Ebola. And now we are, as a compassionate use, we are using it for uh, this virus. Stanford is doing phase three trial right now is IV dose, is 10 days course, and we are having a trial right now doing it for some people. With my own um, report that I get it to a Stanford colleague, it has been helpful in some of the people that they try to do remdesivir. I talked to a colleague at the El Camino Infectious Diseases as well, and they also seen some positive tests as well. Most of the cases right now is about uh, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil. Um, let me just go to the um, here. I wanted to tell you that um, technically, this two medication, which is anti malaria medication, we use it for locus or people have rheumatoid arthritis. We have to understand that this medication it's very cardiotoxic. And especially right now, we are using it uh, with the French study that has been done in very, very small size of a study. It's a very, very um, um, inducing heart arrhythmia. And the dose that people are using, especially for older adult people, it's kind of scary. There are some statements coming in the next days about use of this medication. But FDA approved if you wanted to use it for off-label. Let me tell you back to this. If the chloroquine is going to work, the chloroquine, it works here. It's blocking the virus to come inside the cells. It shows in, 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 in vitro, which is not in human, um, in, in like... A, in only in the mouse, 
that it happens that it, it, it protects influenza virus, not COVID, to not come to the cells, and, but not in the human, and actually in human it failed. As far as like remdesivir, it remdesivir blocked this enzyme. It doesn't let the, actually the virus to replicate and makes more baby viruses and using our cells as the slave. This is the mechanism of this two medication. As far as like a lot of people, they asking that I'm taking this because we talk about AC receptors, then what about the blood pressure medication like AC inhibitor, like lisinopril or sartan? Should I take it or not? First of all, um, um, any total info, um, information we have circulating, especially in the news, that the people that are taking this medication, they're more susceptible to get the COVID-19. Uh, the results are very, very premature. There's no conclusion on that. American Heart Association has a statement that we should not stop this medication. Same thing, we go with uh, pain medication or painkiller medication. Um, um, non straight anti-inflammatory, um, like ibuprofen or Advil and aspirin, they think about maybe increasing receptors that virus used to infect cells. They, in France, they, um, France, they actually recommended to people not taking. But to be honest with you, there's really no data to back up this statement. And physicians in the United States currently recommend that um, either acetaminophen or Tylenol and say it still can be helpful to use. And I, we don't have really any data about it. As I said before, the people, especially in old, any old age that has history of high blood pressure, any history of heart disease in the past, they're very, very, um, um, have a high risk. The people been a smoker in the past, they're very, very high risk as well. And diabetes can increase risk up to 6%. One of the things that it goes to your um, 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 expertise, my majority of the people expertise here in this um, 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 discussion, it's a really, that's a statement uh, published by Brit, uh, British Society of uh, Geriatric. It's about isolation in elderly people. That's one of the major things that, my, my feeling is that after this post COVID-19, we are going to face a very frail, scary geriatric population after that. Um, and they are, they, we're gonna see more depression, we're gonna see more cognitive impairment. We're going to see more anxiety related to that because of this um, situation that we are facing. Um, um, in many countries, um, they're now discussing about what should we do. Um, uh, and this is one of the discussion that we, I had it with many of the colleagues for the last week, especially for the since last week. I've been um, in the task force helping my colleague at New York, which um, really have a discussion with the families of the people in case because right now as you probably know in new york there's a very overwhelming situation and uh, we encourage many of the doctors in new york to call their family and say if your loved one with dementia has respiratory problem do you want it to be transferred or you really just wanted to consider comfort care i think the most important thing in this situation is that we talk about urgent goals of care discussion right now to really ask the preference of the people because the situation, as you probably hear in Italy and Spain, was very, very overwhelming. As the next case I, I hear, as um, we have, um, there is, there is um, not a policy written, but there is a policy, explicit policy in entire healthcare system in the world. If there is a one operation room and there is a one surgeon and there is a one um, young people and there is a one old person, both of them in the life-threatening situation. If they need to go, the surgeon needs to do surgery, the surgeon needs to give priority to the young person and let the old person to die. Um, the same practice we had for the last weeks in Spain and Italy, and the same thing happened in Wuhan. Many of the doctors made the decision to save the ventilators for the young people, to shut off the ventilator for the old people and connect it to the young people. They have to. I'm not saying I'm not criticizing it. They have to. And that's something, the situation that I'm very, very happy till today, April 2nd, we haven't had this situation in the area. But if, that we, if we have a surge, if we have a situation that the hospital is going to be overwhelmed with a lot of the people needs to be in ICU, then the hospitals and the doctors will make a decision based on age. Who's going to be the number one uh, priority? and definitely will be more younger people. We have the same experience in Spain and Italy. You probably hear in Spain, 
many of the residents of the nursing home, they have been completely abandoned in the nursing home to death. And they found that the later, uh, they found that they're all died in their bed and uh, by Spain defense minister. And uh, one of the reason is many of the healthcare providers and the, the caregivers, they became positive and they have to be in isolation. Many of the nurses in nursing home in Spain, they ran away. They really could not able to come to the facilities. And this is the situation happened that we actually lost many older adult people in Madrid, in many centers, which I've been in contact with many of my colleagues there. And I, uh, that situation is really struggling and that's gonna be a very overwhelming situation um, that we are gonna face. I hope we're not gonna go there, but that's something we have to keep in mind. Um, I tried to answer some of the questions quickly about the vaccine. Um, we, one of the reasons that uh, we can, we, we're hoping that we get the vaccine, but of, one of the problem is RNA virus goes to mutation means that they can change frequently. And um, so far we have uh, per month two mutation of this virus. And if that's gonna be the situation, um, and um, again, this is very a slower rate of the compared to influenza virus. Influenza virus technically has eight to 10 mutation per month. And this is why when you get the influenza vaccine this year, you're not gonna be protected next year. You still get influenza next day, the year after because this virus is mutated so fast. But it's still, there is a big discussion here that uh, with this mutation of this virus, do we have any luck to get the vaccine for people? I can tell you for sure, the answer from many of scientists, we're really not optimistic to be able to get the virus. We have to see, we have to see how this virus is gonna act. The only way that we're gonna be successful if this virus does mistake, that's gonna be the best thing happened to human. If the virus does mistake and makes the replication to become less virulent, then that's going to be the success for us. And then we able to, to control it. Some of the answer of the questions, um, if, if I have a pneumonia vaccine, am I protected against COVID-19? The answer is no. Um, again, um, first of all, it's, uh, um, oh, sorry, this is another. Uh, can COVID-19 uh, transmit it through the mosquito bites? No, there's no evidence showing that. Hand dryer, a lot of people are using in social media, is not effective to killing the uh, viruses. Uh, a lot of people use the ultraviolet lamps for killing the viruses. This is also not effective based on, um, again, it may be helpful for laboratory and maybe for surfaces, but just remember the skin are very, very sensitive and you can actually have um, a problem that. What about thermal scanner detect? Uh, can, can thermal scanner detect people with COVID-19? Um, this is exactly go back to the same conversation. Many people, they really don't have any symptoms. They don't have a fever. And that's why this, this thermal scanner only detected people, they have a high temperature. And, um, and again, um, and that's something we should um, remember about it. A spraying of the alcohol or chlorine um, uh, can destroy the COVID-19 virus. And what about drinking alcohol? Um, alcohol, 70% and chlorine is gonna be the best killer for the virus actually. And, um, and it's, but ingestion of the alcohol is not because it's really on the breathing area and is not in the uh, digestive area. Some of the other questions you wanna have is if I have a pneumonia vaccine, am I gonna protect it? The answer is no, because this is pneumonia vaccine, is bacteria, there's nothing to do with that. Some people start to rinsing their nose and mouth or throat with very um, um, high resolution, either saline or, or I hear about the warm um, salt water. Really, there's no evidence showing that it can help with the COVID-19. And the other question, which is very important, a lot of people ask me in many places, taking supplements, vitamins, or probiotics can help with infection. The answer is no. Most of the study and research regarding that it's showing that taking probiotic and vitamins is really not um, having any effects on um, preventing of the cold symptoms as well. And that's why um, it's, uh, many of this um, product is really not uh, controlled very well. The only things about zinc, zinc is not preventing you from getting common cold. Zinc, it's only help if you get a cold, it may shorten the course of the disease but it's not preventing you from 
getting. We have no evidence to showing zinc is helpful for COVID-19 at this level. Now, I'm stopping here. I try to see if you have some review, but I'm happy to answer any question if you have. Thank you, Dr. Ayadi. Um, so yeah, you know, that's a really great source of information and uh, thank you for taking your time. Um, there are a couple touch points that I wanted to, to get into. Um, so recently you've been tasked by the U.S. Senate Special Committee on Aging. Um, this is a governing body that you've been uh, well established with. Um, you're providing them weekly updates to health providers in Congress related to COVID-19. Can you go in a little bit more about this? Because I know that you're more of, you, we know you as a local staple, uh, as a figure in our community, but uh, making that jump from what's going on and uh, in our local area to try to influence national um, national information. Um, can you go in a little bit more about that for us? Sure, absolutely. I mean, it's been, I've been working with, uh, with the team and especially the, um, the, the, the team of um, uh, Senator Susan Collins from Maine um, since 2018. And uh, one of the things happened that we tried to provide more information for aging populations and especially older adults. Uh, there's a couple of things that we work actually together and they've been extremely helpful. One of the things that we um, are doing, uh, which I'm doing it because I'm not expert in other area, but try to provide some information about what should we do in the time of the crisis for older adults, especially to being at home. One of the other tasks that we've been work for providing PPEs and try to find any um, sources that we can bypass many of the regulations for importing of the PPEs for the caregivers, especially focus on more senior care. Um, this is something that we're still working on it. And, uh, and, um, and the other things that uh, we haven't gone through that because it's still not become, became a disaster, we're so glad. But even we were talking uh, through our um, uh, meetings and conversations that if we able to um, train the people who are losing their jobs, um, and um, and technically bring them as a caregiver and um, able to provide the PPEs, give them some trainings, the special intensive uh, training and help them to go um, to the houses of the elderly people. If the situation with COVID-19 is going to be prolonged and um, the elderly people, they have to stay at home for a longer time because we always worry about that we I'm not going to have enough people to really go to the home of the elderly people for the entire United States if that situation is going to be critical as well. These are the topics that uh, it, it's been on the table and it's still on the table and we're still discussing to see how the situation is. We're just waiting day by day to see where actually it, it takes us. I see. Uh, yeah, it definitely is a fluid situation um, to get an accurate reporting from from providers such as yourself uh, onto a national scale is very is very vital. Um, a little bit more locally with regards to Santa Clara County, what are you seeing with regards to that? I mean, there are some changes. I know you had spoken about the the, the age um, range skewing, um, but what are your general feelings about the the foreseeable future in terms of that that aging society and um, the age range dropping down? Do you see yeah, more outliers coming in? Or is that? Yeah, I mean, I, I based on what we have, and yesterday we had um, a big ground round at Stanford as well, which Dr. Norm Brisk, the chief medical officer, provided some information as well. Um, overall, what we have seen, which makes us happy, that we, I think one of the reasons, because Santa Clara started to do earlier than um, other states, as far as like isolation. And I think that was the really effective way. Um, we see some positiveness. I completely agree uh, based on conversation that I had with other folks from other hospitals as well. It's, um, I, I, I think if we are, um, so far it's been, I mean, till last week, we're still very uncertain about it. We are waiting for the next week. We are waiting for next week. We think about next week will be the uh, one of the worst week of uh, this area based on the number of, because this virus is technically replicate. I mean, as far as like incubation period, we talk about six to 12 days. Now, next week and then following week will be the peak. If we are able to pass the next week and then the following week, then we're all going to be very optimistic that May will be a time that we kind of like feeling that we may able to have a different lifestyle in the Santa Clara County. The number is not 
um, is much better than we were expecting. And, uh, and I think the reason is because of, again, the very, very wise decision about closing the school and isolation and shelter in place. Um, we see some young people, actually. It was a report yesterday from David and Stanford. We see some young people also, they got admitted to uh, different hospitals as well. Um, but majority of the people, they have pre-existing condition and more older adult people. Um, the people are in uh, facilities so far. We hear the report of people are positive, but we haven't had like a massive mortality the way that we see in New York. Like for example, my colleague in New York, they just reported every day. They're just sending report. We have the conference call with them every every early morning with them. Actually, I have to uh, manage my time to be in the East Coast for eight o'clock. But they are reporting to me that like in overnight, like six people in nursing homes suddenly they die every single night, and or and and the um, other places as well. Um, and um, New York is very very different situation, and I'm so glad that we're not like that. Thank you, doctor. Uh, so yeah, um, moving on to that, there are a couple points that you talked on earlier with regards to the, the public perception of it, the, the, the general panic. And I know from, from various sources, you've been very vocal about the idea of panic buying. Um, so could you share a little bit more about your views on that uh, with regards to what's the right amount, what, what should be the, the buying habits, what's the ideal uh, for this given situation, both for people that are in families and as well as in isolation? Yeah, I think that we, we, we need to separate these two words, become panic versus anxiety. Um, I think the anxiety related to COVID-19 was very effective. Um, and, I, and I encourage to be anxious about it because uh, that was one of the reasons um, that we all um, been worried about this virus. I remember the time in month of January uh, when this virus started in Wuhan. Um, in order, many of our meetings through my colleagues, American Geriatric Society, different uh, groups that I'm engaged, we 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 brought this concern that we should do something. We cannot uh, because that virus definitely is going to come to us, and we all going to get infected with that. Um, I think that, that at that time, the people tried to be less anxious about it. I think that was a big mistake that we did. I mean, um, I'm, I'm sure that we all going to learn this lesson in the next years to prepare for ourselves from the uh, next pandemic, which is a possibility all the time. I mean, we saw in our life right now. But uh, and I think that's the most important thing is just um, to really pay attention to the anxiety was happening um, for that. Couple reason. Number one is China is a big country and has a lot of international trade with all other worlds. Uh, when the pandemic happened, like for example, Ebola happened in Africa. Africa is not a center for economy, and that's why when Ebola happened in in Africa, we able to um, control it because um, we, we 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 isolated the area. We got the help. We actually have a lot of mortality, but finally we able to not making it as a pandemic. But in, in this um, situation, I think we all, I mean, when, when I'm saying the United States, if every single country, we started very late. And um, when, that, when that situation has started, they should be a little bit more proactive to be anxious about it. Some people now blaming WHO was the one that has really not brought it up to the concern and they were so waiting to hear the report from the Chinese government at that point. I think they're blaming each other right now and mm -hmm. we hear in the news. I'm not pointing on anyone. I'm just saying that being anxious is important when we have this rapid um, um, uh, replicating virus. But panicking is the worst thing that can happen. I mean, one of the problem we had, even like be panicking to hoarding the basic materials and now we have a problem to finding PPEs for people. I think that was one of the biggest mistakes that we've done. We should, we should be anxious, we should prepare for pandemia, but definitely not getting panicked. Because when we think of getting panic, then it's gonna be out of control. The same situation happened actually in New York, which I was so surprised and when I was even talking to many of my colleagues, now they really got panicked about the situation. They could prepare, they had a very good time to prepare the situation, 
again, even for many older adult people, they're discussing about goals of care, put them on comfort care, not transferring them to the hospital. Because again, the situation is right now in Spain and Italy, the people are transferring the older adult people to hospital. They don't treat them. They just leave them in the hallway to let them die. And, no. and because they don't have any bed. They really don't have any bed. Not, they don't want it. They, they want, they don't want, this is not that they don't want it to do. They want it to help, but there is no, um, again, uh, resources. Mm -hmm. and, and touching on this, the, the resources, uh, I know that a lot of our audience is healthcare workers. Um, the, you see a lot on the news, social media, about people improvising due to those shortages. And again, yes, you've been very vocal in, in, in fighting for those shortages. Um, the cloth masks, the, the ones that people are, are um, putting together, are, are those, you know, those are more in line with the surgical mask, but uh, how helpful do you see those in terms of um, the, our frontline workers? Not helpful, not helpful. For the healthcare workers, it's really not helpful. It's better than nothing. But as, as I said, face mask is preventing, if I have the influenza, if I put the face mask, it's helping that other people not getting infected because I can control my droplet. But for people to not getting infected, for especially this kind of virus that's very small, um, then definitely we need a little bit higher level of protection which is gonna be um, protecting the eyes. You probably hear many people actually um, notice in the healthcare workers in Italy, Iran, and South Korea, one of the source of infection is actually hair, especially hair of the ladies, healthcare workers, because it can get easily, uh, virus can uh, sit on the hair for, um, for hours, and then definitely can, and if you touch your hair and touch your face, you can actually get infected easily. Um, and this is why um, the, uh, we definitely need a better, um, uh, 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 again, the level of the protection, which is going to go to N95 masks mm -hmm. and high level of the, uh, for the healthcare workers. But uh, face mask, it's in this situation, is better than nothing. It's not preferred. It's better mm -hmm. than nothing. But face mask is good for the people, like, for example, in the waiting room or the, or the patients who are sick. You can put them in face mask. And they're, okay. they're sick, face masks, you can help them, yeah. So definitely in that situation, let's say we have our home care um, workers or people who are helping seniors at home. Those, those masks that are being made, those could be, re those could be turned towards the, those who, who are showing symptoms, who are having productive or, or any exactly. sort of cough. They exactly. could use those for yeah. them. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank yeah. you. And then, yeah, so by and large, the rule has been, if you feel sick, don't come to work. Is that a hard and fast rule with terms uh, any symptom, um, given the, the idea that uh, this is an asymptomatic um, virus? Um, what, what for you is your, your hard mark for saying, you know, maybe I shouldn't go into work or maybe I shouldn't be out in the public today, um, given that you're in an essential line of work? Because this virus has different manifestation and definitely we see some change in the uh, structure of this virus so far. I just want to say that, again, as I said about mutation, the virus, as far as like a genetic structure, mm -hmm. the one that we are seeing in the United States is not we are seeing in Wuhan anymore. This virus from the month of December till today has been changed significantly. And this is exactly the problem. I said two mutations per month and now think about in four months, we have like eight mutations. Now, the symptoms are getting different right now. Like for example, for the last week, we see many people, they have, uh, especially in older adult people, they, they're reporting a lot of delirious hallucination, a lot of um, um, stroke-like symptoms that is happening in older adult people, which is very strange. We never had this report three months ago. But overall, anybody feel any, any uh, cold symptoms, even cold symptoms, like for example, you have runny nose, muscle pain, um, not necessarily having fever, I think will be better to consider to not go to the work and, and wait for some days to see how the situation, maybe one day or two days. If, if that person develop any more symptoms, like more fever, more muscle pain, um, and some of the other symptoms that I said that has been reported, like loss of the smell, loss of taste and other symptoms, that can be COVID-19. That means that definitely the healthcare worker either isolated himself or herself 
or really go and do a test to make sure it's positive or not. But if it's really not, uh, have, if you have any of these symptoms, I will say for now, for the healthcare worker, any symptoms that you feel that you have a cold symptoms, you should isolate yourself or at least get a test done okay. for the safety purpose. Thank you, doctor. Um, we do have a couple questions here in the chat. Um, I think this one's more with regards to logistics. Um, if you have people that are more than, let's say it's a group or a, a couple in terms of care, um, and we're isolating one of them, do does each person that at that point necessitate uh, their own individual caregivers? Or are we talking about uh, strictly adhering to the PPE and then um, isolating precautions? Then that same caregiver can go ahead and service the rest of the household. Same caregiver uh, can go, yeah. Same, same, caregiver, caregiver. same caregiver can go and put the appropriate PPE. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, another question, uh, do you develop immunity once you've recovered from the virus? I think that's something question. we haven't touched on, yeah. Yeah, it's a very good question. There's a lot of the, uh, the, the, the thing is that it's a possible that we develop the immunity. I mean, there are a small um, um, group of the uh, people that they have done the test, they actually collect their blood, they look at their antibody in their body, I mean, the, the blood. Um, it's been um, it's been a possibility. We're still uncertain about it. As I, I can tell you, as of to April second, um, twenty twenty, we're still not sure. The only way that we're not able to build immunity if this virus is going to mutate more, and then you get exposed to a new structure of this virus. That means they're not. If you if you get that that same structure of the virus, that yes, there's possibility that we actually get immunity based on what we are seeing as well. This is why now they're trying to do plasma infusion, and as FDA actually even approved for the trial to infuse the plasma of the people they got infection and they have an antibody and infuse to the people that are sick. They're doing it right now in many medical centers in the United States. And even I hear that there is some discussion to do it at Stanford as well. But yes, there's a possibility, unless if this virus structure is going to be changed significantly, that means there's no immunity. The same thing with influenza. You don't get immune. You get immunity for the same influenza at the same season, same year because the structure hasn't been changed at the same year, but maybe not next year. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So definitely, yeah, um, again, a fluid situation, you're gonna have to monitor for that, um, seeing how the, the trends are, and definitely the reporting is gonna help that. Um, another couple call um, questions uh, on the chat. Um, why are asymptomatic COVID-19 positive patients uh, not needing self-isolation after seven days. Won't they still transmit the virus to others, even though they don't have symptoms? That's a, that's a good question. Uh, the one thing that they found, the people are asymptomatic after seven days. Um, if like, for example, if somebody's positive and asymptomatic, like for example, if I'm, if I just put a test and I'm positive, is less likely they do virulence virus shedding. It means the viruses that they have, they're just gonna be less concentrated. That's why that person's probably gonna have less chance to infect other people. This is why the estimation is after seven days, if you're positive and there's no symptoms, you can actually um, uh, be out of isolation. Okay. So there's let's see, one more. I think this one comes from directly from one of our clients. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I, just as a as a warning, you know, this isn't meant for um, strict medical advice. Um, but uh -huh. the background on this person is uh, they were diagnosed with eosinophilic fasciitis in 2016. Um, since then, been on various dosages of prednisone and azathioprine. Is that the thioprene, right, uh, right? Among other medications. After hospitalization in October 2019 for pneumonia and pulmonary embolism, the azathioprine was reduced from one milli 100 milligrams daily to 50 milligrams daily. Um, she is 83 years old, and she has these following questions: um, One, what measures can she take to protect herself against the coronavirus, considering her age and underlying health conditions? particularly involving her lungs and considering she's taking an immune suppressant daily. Right. Which is, again, uh, the person is going to be significantly uh, high risk 
for mortality in case if the COVID-19 is going to happen. The same situation. Um, uh, this is immunosuppressive medication, and, that's, uh, uh, and that means that it's just going to be very high risk that if they get infections, they quickly develop their ARDS and severe respiratory symptoms, and that definitely that person should be very, very restrictive, isolate herself, and, um, and definitely if she has to go outside and expose to other people, she should have a proper uh, way of the PPEs. I definitely recommend for that person to have N95 mask. If they need to go and see other people, definitely use gloves, washing the hands, the same principle of measures, uh, more um, aggressively, more aggressively. But definitely that person is a very, very high risk for a uh, severe uh, manifestation of COVID-19. And that brings up another question is, for those taking care of an older loved one or client, um, the, the, the regularly scheduled doctor's appointments, um, what's the call on that considering resources and, and, and um, the idea of uh, you know, um, triaging people who, who need help versus um, the, the, the regular visits that they have scheduled throughout the year? Right. As far as as far as like a, um, a currently at this situation, based on what we have a guideline from uh, also the CMS that they do, they do not recommend to have any routine follow up schedule for now. I mean, now everything has been pushed back to the month of June for most of the people. And they are, I mean, personally, even for my own patients, actually, any non urgent situation needs to be postponed uh, right now. Um, we are not sure about what happened after May uh, 4th. Um, if everything's going to go well in the next four weeks, um, the only concern some people are bringing in right now is that if after May 4th we have still the airports are active, people can travel to other states, we may have a new cases as well. These are all the still the dilemma that we all facing right now. We're really not sure how it's going to respond in month of May and June if it's going to have more cases whenever the isolation and the sheltering place is going to be lifted. But um, definitely for people for routine follow up, I will say we should delay everything for now because um, uh, medical centers are going to be very risky and very high chance of the people get contaminated. For urgent uh, visits, what we are offering right now based on the guideline from government is everybody through the telemedicine and telehealth, which is through the internet and uh, through the monitor, FaceTime, Skype, the doctors can actually connect to the people and can see them over the monitor. I know it is important to do, if the doctor feels that the person needs to be exam, um, that's gonna be a different situation which the doctors can arrange for that. This is only for urgent. Uh, yes. But definitely not any routine follow-up with any specialty or even the primary care doctor for now. Okay. And does that include for labs? Uh, there are some clients that we have that need to get their, um, their blood thinners readjusted on a, on a, a reoccurring basis. How does that, how does one handle or navigate going through that? The labs are still or up there. The, most of the labs are open. And for some of the patients that they prefer to use a portable, I mean, there are some of the companies, they actually do phlebotomists. They actually go, they follow the CDC guideline and they okay. go and they, they do it at home. Some people actually, if they are homebound, home health is still can be helpful. I mean, I know that I've been using home health. Medicare actually um, make a little bit less regulations regarding home health situation. Home health can be very helpful for checking by the nurses, go to the home, see the people, do the blood drawn for the, for the patients, not the PTOT for just the situation of the home. Um, they, know, they don't need to really meet the criteria for homebound because all the elderly should be homebound right now. And this is exactly the conversation that uh, Medicare also, CMS also re uh, released as well um, uh, two weeks ago. That, uh, and that's, I will say, I personally use home health for many of my patients that they, they need at this point to, to have um, a blood test, urgent blood test to be done and um, they can use that. Um, but again, the labs are still open. Most of the commercial labs, Quest, lab corps, they're open. They can, they can take the person if they wanted to go and do the quick blood test and come back. But if this is not urgent blood work, I will postpone it for another, for another four weeks. Okay. 
Doctor, um, well, yeah, so um, there's another question uh, we have here uh, regarding uh, frontline workers. Uh, there are, yeah, and, and you know, you know the, the landscape of the industry. So you know multiple people are working for different facilities and agencies. Sure. Yeah. What is the, the professional responsibility or the, the guideline for those who are going into multiple settings? Uh, you yourself also transitioning between hospital and, and personal, right. especially with your work at the consult center. Um, how do you navigate that aspect of it, going from either case to case or from person to person or case to facility? Yeah, that's 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 a uh, that's a problem. I mean, I will say that's not uh, that's something that we um, what we what we recommend uh, for everyone to really follow the basic protections, um, which again, um, washing the hands. Um, I will say definitely what, what I what I do actually when I go and visit someone and if I go to the hospital, I uh, definitely. Um, I don't go from the hospital directly to see a person at home. I mean, I definitely go and change my clothes first, uh, make sure that um, um, even um, I use the protection for my shoes as well, even if I'm coming from the outside to other places as well. I mean, kind of like a basic protection is so important. I will say as far as we are, really make the washing very well, changing the uh, scrubs as well. Um, that can be that can be helpful. That can be the best thing we can do. Even for the for the caregivers when they come home, this is exactly the recommendation that we all recommend. Even for we recommend it for our residents, for fellows, for any other people. But definitely when they come home, make sure they cleaning um, them. So they're washing their hands very first, very well. They make sure they put the shoes in the plastic bag um, and not living in the garage or somewhere and they have a plastic bag outside in the garage and closing that plastic bag. If they want to use it tomorrow, they can use it tomorrow as well if they're going to the same place. But if they have a, a shoes cover, they can use the shoes cover as well. And then they just dump the shoes cover in their garbage can. And the other thing is that definitely change their scrubs. We even recommend for, especially for frontliner, like in you know, people working in ICU, that definitely dump their scrub in the plastic bag or, or or directly um, just wash them. And uh, that's very, very important because the clubs can be infected. The scrubs can be infected as well, especially if you go back home or moving from home of one person to other person. Okay. Well, that seems to sum up a lot of our questions, uh, all of our questions at this point. Um, and thank you for, for that time with the presentation. Um, I guess, uh, I'm sure that if there are any further questions regarding our clients or the senior aging community, uh, the information's up there with the Geriatric Con Consult Center. Uh, they're located in Los Altos. Um, both of those emails will be good to reach out to you. Yeah, or absolutely. Is one uh, my Stanford email, my Stanford email can be helpful, can be better. Yeah, because I can check it, check it uh, more frequent. Or other people are also checking my Stanford email. Mm -hmm. That and, they can address it to me. Yeah, my MA audio is Stanford.edu. Yeah. Okay. And uh, also, if there are any other questions that we can forward. Um, by, by yes. all means, you can yeah. reach out to us here at Care Indeed as well, uh, www.careindeed.com. Um, Dr. Ayati, thank you. I know this is a really busy time, uh, definitely a stressful time, um, but we do thank you for preventing any spread of misinformation and, and setting a lot of records straight for us today. Sure, thank you so much. Thank you for arranging it. Um, very happy to be with you all. All right, all right, Dr. Ayati, you have a good day, everyone. Thank you, you for coming thank you. Yeah, and have a great day. one.